Well, this morning or this week, the uh, Board of Trustees will be in town, and um, that brings uh, a special privilege this morning. Um, it is my privilege to introduce our speaker, uh, Courtney Doctor. Um, Courtney is uh, and has a true Covenant College family. Uh, Courtney and her husband, Craig, have four children, Austin, Braden, Shelby, and Rebecca. Austin and Braden are both graduates. Shelby is currently a student here now, and Rebecca will be in a, in a couple of years. Um, Courtney and her husband, Craig, both graduated from uh, Covenant Seminary with MDivs in 2013, and they are both uh, on staff at Kirk of the Hills in St. Louis, Missouri, where Courtney is the vice um, Courtney is the Director of Women's Ministry and Assimilation. She's also the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors at Providence uh, Classical Christian Academy in St. Louis. Uh, she also serves on the Advisory Board uh, at Covenant College. She has recently received a contract to publish a Bible study that she has written, which will be out in 2016. Uh, and, this is an interesting thing to say, she is an avid horsewoman, which when you're looking that on, at that on paper, kind of makes me picture like half horse, half woman. <laughs> but when she stands up here, you'll see that is clearly not the case. I think Courtney <laughs> loves horses. Uh, but as, as I was coming up to talk, I was telling someone uh, I had this thing to introduce her, but really it just boils down to she's just pretty awesome. So if you would please uh, give a warm welcome for Courtney Doctor. <laughs> Thank you. What a fun introduction. I may be half horse. I don't know. Um, it is an honor to be here today, and I am fully aware that almost everybody that gets up here says something similar, but what you all need to know is that it really is. It is a tremendous honor to be here and to be asked to come and to be with you all, so thank you for having me. For me, one of the reasons that this is such an honor is because I love this place. There are so many things about, I love the location. I mean, what's not to love about that? I, I drove Shelby up the mountain this morning to, she spent the night with me last night, and as we were driving down, you know, it was one of those where the clouds were covering most of Chattanooga. It was breathtaking. I love this place. I love the mission, and I love the purpose of this place. I love the people, clearly some, more than others, but I love the people here. I, this place is a special place for me and for my family. And part of what I love about this place are things that are, are distinct or they're unique about this place, things that Covenant itself would claim as distinctives. And so I love the Reformed faith. I love the fact that what you're getting here is a Christian liberal arts education. But the one that I want to talk about today, the thing one of the distinctives that I love about this place is something that you not only hear about, but you live it every day, and it's, it's the focus on community. And community can become kind of a buzzword around here. Community is a priority around here, and I know that different people hear that word community, and they, they react in different ways. For some of you, you hear that word community, and you think, I want that. Whatever, whatever that word means, I want it. And you, you actively pursue it. And for others, you think, I hear about it, and I, I might see it over there. I wish I had it. And I know there are people in the room that think, you know, community, that's just, that's just not my thing. I don't really like people that much. I don't really need people. And so this word, community, can be an emotionally loaded word. And I think that there's a danger when we talk about it so much and use it so casually and when the word becomes so common. And the danger is this. It's in me thinking or in you thinking, well, I live on a hall with all of these people or I eat my meals with all of these people. I see these people as I walk across campus. Therefore, therefore, I am in Community. That must be what that word means. Well, community is not less than that. 
Community is not less than living life with people, but being in community is more than just coexisting with a bunch of people. So the mere fact that you live on a hall with a certain number of people does not guarantee that you're in real community with them. The question I want to ask today is why the emphasis on community here? Why is it something that Covenant would claim as a distinctive? Is it just a, is it just a great idea that Covenant College had to have community? Is it, is it the latest trend in social thought? You know, hey, we've discovered something really great called community. Y'all should, y'all should try it. No, community is actually God's idea. But why? Why does God want you to live in community with each other? Does he have a purpose for putting us in community? Does he have a, a way that community is supposed to be lived out? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. And so we can go back to the very beginning of the story. We can go back to Genesis 1 and 2, and we can see that we were actually created for relationship. It's the one thing that wasn't good in the garden was that Adam was alone. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, we have this, this majestic telling of the creation of the world. And God himself is, is delighting in what he's doing and what he's seeing. And, and he comments on it and he says, you know this, he comments seven times and he says, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. And then all of a sudden he looks at something and he says, it's not good. And when he says that, that's in Eden. That's in the garden. That's before sin disrupted the world. That's when everything was as it was supposed to be. And God looks around and he says, it is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. So why does God say that? Because we were created to be in relationship with other people. The refrain, the refrain through all of scripture, through the entire story of redemption, is that God is redeeming a people for himself so that he can be their God and so that they will be his, his people, his community of believers. It's one reason why you don't or why you shouldn't sit at home on Sunday mornings and watch church on TV. Like Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. You need to be with the people of God. You need to be with a community of believers. So I think we can make a case biblically that relationships are important. But does God ever comment on what those relationships are supposed to look like? Is there a way that he designed them? Is there a way that he desires them <coughs> to be? Absolutely. One of the first things that God does in this great story of redemption, early on in the story, what does he do? He creates a people for himself goes into Egypt and he, he rescues his people, he redeems them, he calls them to himself, and then he gives them this identity and he gives them this purpose and he says, you're a treasured possession to me and I've got, I've got a way I want you to live this out. You're actually going to be a holy nation. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. And then immediately after he does that, immediately after he forms his people, he tells them, he's like, and as, my, as a community of believers, as my people, you need to know how to love me, and you need to know how to love each other. And so he gives them the Ten Commandments, and the first three are all about, this is how you love me, this is how you honor me, this is how you trust me. He's telling them how to be in relationship with himself, and then the next seven are all about how they're supposed to be in relationship with each other, how they're to live in community with each other. And he tells them, hey, don't lie to each other. Don't steal from each other. Don't cheat each other. Don't kill each other. But are those the ultimate things that God can say to us about living in community together? Hey, just, just don't kill each other. Is that kind of the most that he can hope for in how we treat each other? Hardly. Absolutely. It's the bare minimum of what he can expect. Jack Collins says it's like the floor, the floor of a great cathedral. The floor, when you walk into a great cathedral, if you've ever been in one in Europe and you walk in, the floor is the the place that you enter. It's the place on which you stand. It is, it is the bottom, but the point of walking into that cathedral is to lift your eyes and to lift your head to the ceiling and to see this majesty and to see this grandeur, this, this thing that actually takes your breath away 
with awe and wonder. And so when we're talking about community, the Ten Commandments are actually the bare minimum. They're, they're the floor of where we enter into community. The ceiling is the character of God himself. And so I want us to look in Scripture to see where that ceiling might be. So fast forward through the story to the middle of the first century. And there's a town, a little town, not a little town, a big town, Corinth. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to write a letter to Corinth because their relationships with each other are not what they're supposed to be. They are a community of people, but they're not doing community the way the Lord intended them. So Paul addresses these problems. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing these problems that they're having in their relationships with each other and all of these areas that cause division among them. He confronts their sin. He encourages them to appreciate each other. And, and when we get to chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, we have this great essay on their connectedness. He uses the analogy of a body, and it's, it's how they're connected, saying they're really, really like one body, that that's actually how much they need each other. And, you know, he says the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you, or the eye to the ear. They need each other. They're to value each other. They are to take care of each other. They are to use their gifts to serve each other. But then you get to this last verse in chapter 12. After he's explained to them what it looks like to be connected, the importance of, of serving and caring for each other, and the last verse in chapter 12 says this, but I'm, I'm going to show you a still more excellent way. Better than just living together in the same place at the same time. Better than just serving each other. And what Paul does in chapter 13 is Paul actually lifts our eyes. He lifts our heads to the grandeur of the ceiling. He lifts our eyes to the beauty of the character of God himself. And it's why I picked this text today, because Paul is saying this in 1 Corinthians 13. No matter what else you do, if you all miss loving each other, you've missed it all. What he's saying is the way, the way you guys do community here, it matters. Chapter 13 is read at weddings a lot, and it's certainly one application of it, but Paul was not writing to a husband and a wife. Paul is writing to a church. Paul is writing to a community of believers, and this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 13. What he's doing is he first sets up this just fundamental primacy of love. And he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I'm saying if, you are, if you're quite gifted, if you're quite eloquent, but you don't have love, he says, just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, you know, something that just all that talk, but it, it just irritates and it just calls attention to itself. And he says, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, you know, if you're someone who can ace a Bible content exam, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, you know, if you're, some, if you're just a spiritual giant, but you don't have love, he says, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, you know, if you're someone who would give the shirt off your own back, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, if you're somebody who would literally take a bullet for someone else but have not love, he says, I gain nothing. Those are strong statements. If you don't love each other, he's saying, no matter what else you do, no matter what else you have, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how generous you are, no matter how smart you are, he says, you've missed it. You've missed it. And then he goes on to describe for us exactly what love is and what love is not. He says, love is patient and kind Love doesn't envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And so Paul starts off with two positives. Love is. Love is patient, and love is kind. And when we hear that, I want you to hear the slightest echo coming up from way back in Exodus 
Back in Exodus 34, there is this echo coming to us of love is patient and love is kind because Exodus 34 is where God comes to Moses and he tells Moses who he is. But Exodus 34 comes after Exodus 3. Exodus 3 is when God goes to Moses. He says, I'm going to tell you my name. I am who I am. And then everything between Exodus 3 and Exodus 34 is God saying, no, I'm going to show you what I am can do. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you great wonders and miracles. And then in Exodus 34, we get there and God says, now I'm going to tell you who I am is. And Exodus 34 says this, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, patient, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And the word that's used there is actually the word that means the kindness of the Lord. I am, the great I am is patient, and the great I am is kind. God is patient with us. God is kind to us. He is filled with this loving kindness towards us, and he actually enters into relationship with us because he's patient and because he's kind. And I would argue that we are actually not capable of loving in a 1 Corinthians 13 way until we've been loved like this. 1 John 4, 19, we love, why? Because he first loved us. So here's the way it goes. God first loves us. God is patient with us. God is kind with us. God enters into relationship with us. And then God changes our hearts and enables us to actually be able to love him. And then he changes our hearts. We love him. And then he says, if you love me, you are going to love my people. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into a community, I'm going to put you into a community to work that out. I want you to be patient and kind with each other because I have been patient and kind with you. That is, that is the call of the Lord. First John goes on to say, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so community, and when I say that, I mean community done right, it's not just a good idea. It's not just the latest social trend. Community is actually a result of our salvation. So I want to ask you today, have you experienced the love of God? If you haven't, I invite you to receive the patient and the kind and the good love of our Lord. If you have experienced and received the love of our Lord, then I want you to think about all the people that God has put you in community with here. And by that, I mean the people you know really well and the people that you only recognize their face, but you don't know their name yet. So I want you to think of roommates. I want you to think of people on your hall and people on your floor. I want you to think of the people that you eat with regularly or the people that are just constantly at that table next to you in the great hall. I want you to think of the people that are two rows up from you now and two rows back. You get my point, the people that you pass on the sidewalks here. And I want you to listen to Paul's words again. I want you to use them as a mirror to reflect how well are you doing community here, today, this afternoon, this week. This is what Paul says. He says, good community is loving. And this is what that love looks like. Love is patient. The King James Version says, it suffers long. And to be patient with somebody sometimes feels like suffering for a long time. It's the fact that we deal with, we deal with people's irritations. People irritate us. We deal with their difficultness, not just for a day or an afternoon, but for however long God has you in community together. And to be patient is, is more of a refraining from. It's more of an enduring. It's, it's a little bit more passive where kindness is active. Kindness moves towards. Love is kind. It does something. Kindness compels us to move towards people, to do something kind, to speak a kind word. And I would encourage you, never miss an opportunity to speak a kind word. You have no idea what the ripple effects of that kind word might be in that person's life and in the, the whole of the community here. And then comes this list of seven things that everything love is not. Everything that cannot be in us if we are loving. Everything that would destroy good community. And he says this, love does not envy and love does not boast. And I thought about that this week and I thought, 
you know, to envy is we envy what we don't have and we boast about what we do have. And what Paul's saying here is they're both destructive. Love is not arrogant. Are there people in your community, people in the community here that, that truly, in the quietness of your heart, you truly think you're better than? And I don't mean better at something. I just mean better than. We all struggle with that. What Paul's saying here is love is not arrogant. Love doesn't think like that. Love is not rude. He says, are, are you considerate? Are you, are you polite? Are you thoughtful, both in, both in how you act and in, in what you say? Are you characterized by consideration and kindness? He says, love does not insist on its own way. It is not selfish. It is not demanding. And that's a hard one to live out in the context of your day-to-day -day lives, that it doesn't insist on its own way. We all want what we want, and love lays that down. It is not irritable or resentful. I think that's a good word for siblings and for roommates. The things that irritate us, the things that cause us to resent people in our community. Paul's saying love is not irritable or resentful. He says, love does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Are you someone that when you hear somebody is, is embarking on an adventure that they shouldn't be embarking on, do you think it's kind of funny? Do you rejoice in it in some way? What Paul's saying here is love doesn't do that. Love rejoices with what is good and what is right. And then Paul ends this beautiful summary of the effects of loving like this. And he says, love bears all things. He says, you hang in there with each other. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. I mean, you, you choose to think the best of someone. Love hopes all things. Hoping all things means that you know God is at work in the situation. God is faithful. He will not leave us or forsake us. And God is at work. Love endures all things. And you realize what Paul's done is he's taken us right back up to being patient. Patient endures all things. So can you see why Jesus would say to us that by this, by this kind of love, to love each other in a 1 Corinthians 13 way, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you love like this, they're going to know something's different. They're going to know that you belong to me. Our love for each other, it actually proclaims that we've been transformed by love itself. And so community is not just some buzzword. It's not just the latest thought or social trend. And community done right should be a distinctive here. It should be unique in this place. It's why God can say that it is the most excellent way to love like he's loved us and to love because he's loved us. Let's pray. Father God, your love is amazing. Your love is eternal. Your love is transformative. And Father God, we bow before you to praise you for the love that you have shown us, the love that you have showered on us. Father God, I pray that our response would be to love others because we have been so well loved. And so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternal, reigning, ruling, sovereign, and good God, we ask that you would do that work in this community even today. We pray.